Good evening and welcome to uh, the Royal Aeronautical Society Farnborough Branch June Lecture. So tonight's lecture is on the subject of the ethics and legality of UAV operations and is going to be given by uh, Tony uh, Gillespie. Tony um, currently is the uh, visiting professor at uh, UCL, uh, uh, obviously up in London, but has um, a lot of experience uh, having started his uh, uh, career developing radar technologies for smart musicians, uh, working for DARA and subsequently ZSTL. Uh, his interest in uh, uh, UAVs led to developments in the technical aspects and legal reviews of weapon systems and obviously since he's retired uh, he's been the technical advisor to the United Nations, MOD and other organisations. Um, hopefully I'm going to hand over to Tony soon. Thank you for the introduction. I've put three particular law courts on the in, uh, on the title slide. The one in the centre we're all familiar with, the Old Bailey. The one on the left is the US Supreme Court, which uh, interferes quite a bit in these in things. But both of those are somewhat irrelevant for weapons control and crimes with weapons. The right hand court, the International Criminal Court, is the one that matters. And I will be discussing that in due course. Basically, I'm going to be going through the history, explain what international humanitarian law is. Some of you may know this as LOAC, the Law of Armed Conflict. Lawyers assure me there is a very subtle difference between the two, but I haven't been able to get them to explain exactly what it is. Uh, then the technical solutions for UAVs to meet international humanitarian law, the problems with autonomous weapons, which are very different to UAVs, and the implications from that which lead to new liabilities for suppliers, employees of suppliers, in fact the whole everybody involved with defence and exactly the same problems come up with autonomous cars. And finally I'm going to talk about technical approaches that have been developed and then leave some uh, a few problems that are not yet solved. It doesn't seem like 30 years ago that the cruise missiles were used in the Gulf War, but they were. There was general acceptance, in fact, wonder that they worked so well because they had a predefined target. They had a route which was pre-planned and they went and hit the target. And whether they be Tomahawk or the um, Storm Shadow launch from Tornado GR4. It did make the public aware of UAVs when we went into the Gulf War II with Predators and Reapers and there were lots of fears of killer drones if we uh, attach weapons to them. And some of you may remember there was a letter by Elon Musk to the United Nations more or less demanding that they introduce an immediate ban on autonomous weapons and he got several hundred scientists to sign it and it's a totally useless letter. I'll come back to exactly why later because there are already United Nations discussions going on on lethal autonomous weapons and they're the ones that matter and um, I'll get into why if, if you banned autonomous weapons you don't ban anything else. So it's open door to any type of weapon you want with high levels of automation. International humanitarian law, the bit that matters are the Geneva Conventions and treaties and conventions since then. It's got a history right back to 1300 or earlier and chivalry and so on. But there are five basic principles involved. Military necessity, in other words, there has to be a real military reason to attack a particular target. Not, I want to go there, or I suspect there's something there. You've got to have a real reason. Humanity means that you can't use weapons like um, dum-dum bullets and generally cruel weapons. Proportionality means that 
any collateral damage that occurs has to be justifiable against the military requirement and the importance of the target. The extreme example is you don't launch a nuclear bomb to knock out a dispatch rider carrying some message between enemy camps, but it can get to a very fine distinction and there are a lot of arguments with the Israeli-Gaza conflict about proportionality and obviously the Israelis say they're being proportional, the people in Gaza say they're definitely not. Distinction is one that is technically difficult because you have to be able to distinguish between your opposition and civilians and you have to make your own people distinguishable as well. So there has to be a clear line of these are legitimate targets, these are my troops. And environmental protection has been added as well, that you're not allowed to destroy the environment, to destroy the um, enemy. Now, the other one that comes in is a convention on certain conventional weapons. I won't read the whole title, it's quite long and torturous, but it's called the CCW Protocol. And this is the one that bans specific or limits specific things, non-detectable fragments. You must have fragments that are left in people's bodies that are detectable by x-rays, ultrasonics and so on. Mines and booby traps and other devices that obviously follows with the um, Princess Di work and so on, incendiary weapons, blinding ways of weapon, weapons and explosive remnants of war. The debate in the United Nations is whether lethal autonomous weapons should actually be part of um, this CCW protocol. And in the last 12 months, it's become generally accepted that if that route is to be, if there is going to be a ban, then it has to come up through the CCW protocol and they're leading or supervising the negotiations. The argument is whether we actually need any change to the law. And to put at the bottom, the Navy is always different. The San Remo manual covers naval operations. So I've already said the Geneva Convention Additional Protocol 1. The basic rule says that military forces and the weapons they use will always be under control, only used against military objectives, and you will protect civilians. If you've got a machine learning system which can give non-deterministic and possibly unpredictable decisions, can you say that's under control? I don't think you can, and most people don't think you can. So what are the legal tests that you would apply to such a system? In the legal technical side, Article 36 is the big one. It basically says if you bring in a new weapon, and particularly a means or method of warfare, so it's not just a weapon, so a whole system of systems bringing together many parts is a new means or method of warfare, then the part, the country that's about to use it must actually get its lawyers to say whether it can meet international law. It doesn't say it has to always meet international law because if there are times when it can't, you're not allowed to use it and that's the rules of engagement. And they're specifically not part of the Article 36 review, but we as engineers have to provide evidence for the Article 36 reviews and lo and behold, when you get to the nitty gritty of setting rules of engagement, 90% of that engineering evidence is needed to help set the article, the rules of engagement. Now, the bit that is changing with autonomous weapons is that Article 36 reviews, they, according to the conventions, they're conducted at key dates during procurement, but they do need actual performance of the weapon system. So that's usually been interpreted as engineering and trials data with the weapon as it's being delivered. So setting to work and the trials when there's all the nauseous integration problems of matching a weapon with the aircraft or tank or ship or whatever it is, there's a weeks of work goes into getting it working right. And those trials are used to go to the lawyers and say this is how it works and then as a spin-off from that 
you get the rules of engagement or guidance on it. So when there's an operation, there's a data pack you can turn to. As I've said, if you've got non-deterministic systems, then you need a new approach. And this is where not just the lawyers, but those of us who've been involved with this from the more technical side, actually say you need to have these Article 36 reviews much earlier in the procurement process. They are usually held when the concept comes up to say, is this legitimate? Can it meet international law? Yes. And then not much happens until the end when you're doing the trials. Now we're actually saying that you definitely need to do it at key stages. My own personal view is that key stage is every design review. And the question is, do you need a new international convention to say what data has to be presented? Because design reviews don't necessarily show the proved performance, but they do shape the performance and they show the performance of the concept and the validation process. Now, I've already said the legal reviews are conducted by lawyers. And here we get to what the lawyers look for, and they look for this in highly automated systems. In my own work, uh, when I was with DSTL, I was in the group of people who had to produce evidence to show you've got predictable actions, you've got a clear command chain with one authorised operator, and that person has authorization to act. And it, must, and it must be one individual. And you must have known responsibilities and know what happens if there's a system failure. So summarising, you can unambiguously define its behaviour. And as we all know, machine learning systems, sometimes when they come up with an answer, people say, why? What did it do? Don't understand that. If you were to say that to a lawyer, uh, one type of lawyer would rub their hands with glee and say lots of fees for me coming up to, to have that argument with people. But the international lawyers and certainly anybody concerned with the International Criminal Court would say that is a crime. But you still need technical evidence, actual system. And if you do have, well, you're not allowed to have unpredictable behaviour. You've got to have limits. Those limits have got to be reflected in the rules of engagement when you write them for such a system. Back in 2010, Robin West, who was an ex, or then he was an ex-naval lieutenant commander, and I did some thinking about this. Uh, I chaired a NATO research task group looking at the problems of operating manned and unmanned aircraft together. And there were lots and lots of solutions. And we actually decided or drew the conclusion unanimously that the technology wasn't the problem. It was international law or international humanitarian law and how we could use it and how you used it to meet law then set the technologies that you wanted to develop. So then we began to look at the whole design process. And you've got the traditional analysis side, you have the military users, the MOD analysts sit down and work out what you want, the procurement authorities write the contract and that's awarded to a prime contractor and then the supply chain. In an, an engineer would call it capability engineering, system of system engineering and project engineering. And we get to the usual V diagram, which a lot of you probably know, which is essentially translating the left onto a time basis where in principle you have a nice flow of requirements down to the bottom and the bottom subcontractor delivers against those requirements. You put it together, build it all up again, and you set it to work. In practice, of course, it's iterative. There are changes of um, procurement requirements. As the system develops, you realise things are not quite what you expected. You have to do changes. The customer changes their mind. The law changes, and you have to change with regard to that. And so you have the verification and validation process, testing and inspection, which actually happens at all stages. But conceptually, it's a straightforward process 
and it's nice to keep that in mind when you're discussing autonomous systems. What Robin and I came to the conclusion was when we translated the Geneva Conventions and the, those five principles into engineering or procurement requirements, we came up with seven requirements for military necessity. I'm not going to go through all of them, but these were the main ones. The clear command chain, which I've said, the concept of authorised entities, which is the person or thing that is authorised to take action and make the decision that yes, it is a legitimate target and yes, collateral damage is acceptable or it is a legitimate target, collateral damage is not acceptable, therefore we don't, don't release the weapon. And it has knock-on effects that you have to define what information you need for that decision. If you've not got the information, you can't make the decision. So do you ask someone else? Do you go up the chain? And then you have to have contingencies if there's a communication breakdown. The humanitarian requirements led to assessment of the threats, the effect of what you're doing, the effect of the weapon. Last minute diversions, it's all right if you've got a weapon that you can divert, like a laser guided bomb, but if the target is in a difficult area, it's no use having that, releasing that weapon if the only diversion is into another area full of civilians. So that would be an even bigger crime. So those decisions have to be made before weapon release, and that leads on to decision timelines. Distinction, obviously, how do you know it's a, it's a legitimate target? Do you know it's actually hostile people there and so on? And the potential collateral damage, which brings in to the requirement, people talk about target identification. In fact, Identification of non-targets is just as important as identification of targets because you have to know what non-targets are around the target. And then the proportional requirements, proportionality requirements are a bit softer, but you need to quantify them. And one of the things that came out from our 2010 work was the requirement for rules of engagement to be made digital. So they could not just digital to send over a data link, but digital so an automated system could interpret them and apply them. How do you turn that into engineering? The three part model of human decision making is a standard psychologist model. Uh, Chuckle Boyd back in the days of the Vietnam War came up with the OODA loop, observe, orient, decide and act. And basically, there are three elements. Awareness, which is what's actually going on. Did I expect this? Yes, no. What if it isn't what I expected? Why isn't it? And actually understand what's happening. Think about it. And then what happens if I do release the weapon or if I don't release it? What's going to happen if there's a an attack going on, not, re not releasing the weapon may have more important effects. In fact, it may be a, a criminal act that you don't release the weapon because you're not stopping something happening. And then the act is the final part. And so, as I've said, you can actually turn qualitative decisions into quantitative ones, which give uh, technical implement implementation, or at least it gives you scope to argue. Uh, the number of discussions I've had with lawyers about the difference between reasonable certainty of identification with 95% based on trials in a similar environment. Is that reasonable, please, Mr. Attorney General? And so you can get into a sensible argument. And then each of these blocks becomes subsystems. And all decisions on the way through are made by authorised entities, the concept I've described, and I'll come back to that later. And then you get into the functions with eight to ten for each part, and the inputs and outputs of what goes in and out, straightforward, but they must be written specifically as requirements because usually 
the, the awareness functions are likely to be provided by a different supplier or a different part of the same company from the understanding part. So you've got to define the interfaces and have interface requirements and specifications and so on. So you get down into real hard detail and all these have flown directly from the Geneva Convention Additional Protocol 1. And the next question is, is that an absolute requirement? No, it's the UK interpretation of the Geneva Convention. The Americans have a different interpretation. The Chinese and Russians have different interpretations. So if you're a weapon supplier, you've got to make sure that your weapon, that these technologies actually meet that country's interpretation of the law. Their interpretation is written down. The uh, additional protocol one and the various CCW protocols have huge annexes where every country has actually put up their own interpretation. And so there's lots of reading there and lots of problems. The qualitative assessments, you've actually got to predict what the collateral damage is going to be. So not only have you got to know what the non-targets are, as I've said, as well as the targets, you need dynamic modelling. Now that's all right in the mission planning stage. And if you're the operator of a predator, for instance, then you've got some good idea of what's going on at the scene with real time um, video surveillance. So you can make as good a judgment as anything else. If you've got a more automated weapon, that has some level of uh, choice in what it does, you've actually got to have that prediction software on board the weapon and know that it gives a decent prediction, have proved that to the lawyers. And then you've got to have a database with the weapon effect data, which we have at the moment, nice safely with the operator or the remote person. If you have a highly automated weapon, do you want that weapon to carry all the data about your the weapon effects it's usually at secret level so you're going to launch your weapon carrying secret information into hostile territory with the chance it won't work or the enemy will neutralize it or out in the debris the chip with the secret data on will still be readable so there's all sorts of security implications and also you need battle damage assessment because part of um, proportionality is that and necessity is if you've taken out a target you can't go back in and take it out again because there may well be aid workers going in to deal with the wounded and so on and then you're attacking uh, medical people and the first and maybe even red cross people so you have to know when to stop as well and so reliability of identification becomes part of the decision making. And that's one of the biggest problems. I won't go into it in this talk, but you must be aware of all the um, debate, particularly with uh, police identification of people and surveillance and how reliable are cameras and that sort of surveillance system. And the answer is nothing like as good as the press would have you believe. A direct example of the effect of international law. There are lots of photographs of the phalanx system, the close-in missile, the close-in defence system for a ship. And this sits on the side of whatever ship you want to put it on it came in it was in in the Falklands War and the uh, director has a radar and it picks up income even incoming shells and it fires some horrendous rate of fire of heavy bullets I think it's 7,000 rounds a, a minute something like that it only has to fire three or four to take out whatever's coming in and you've probably seen scenes of where it's been used in Afghanistan and Iraq to defend the bases. It looks quite simple. You put it on a truck, bolt it, bolt it to the truck, drive the truck to wherever you want to defend, put the jacks down, 
just like a big crane and it's stable and, and you can use it. No, because you don't know where the bullets are going to go. You don't know if it's going to be taking out um, an innocent UAV or an innocent plane. So people actually got together and the lawyers got heavily involved. And they actually had to develop some new ammunition for the weapon because it has a range of about five kilometers, I think, are the figures. Those new bullets that it fires actually disintegrate after three seconds. <laughs> so that when they land, they're just a whole lot of little debris and come down as tiny little bits of essentially dust. And that took quite a bit of um, developing by whichever the manufacturer is of the, of the bullets. The other thing they had to do to make sure you don't take out either friendly aircraft coming in, because if you're by a base, you've got lots of um, friendly air, air vehicles, you may have your own surveillance drones going around. So they had to hook the whole system together to have a real time controller who was surveying all the information and he would authorize where the phalanx could fire when an alarm came in. So the simple act of moving an excellent weapon to do an excellent job to defend bases produced huge amounts of money being spent and a huge development program and new new bullets, surprisingly, just because of the application of international law to that change of use. Now, question, definitions, Leon Musk's um, letter. And I, I think I got this from Bob Frampton. I'm not sure if he's a member of the group, but he was one of the uh, assistant directors at DSTL. What does fully autonomous mean as far as unmanned aircraft are concerned? The military person or the civilian in charge goes to work one morning, the hangar's empty. So he asks, I wonder who those unmanned aircraft are hunting today. I don't know. That's a fully autonomous weapon of the sort that Leon Musk is talking about. And no, it's clear from, I hope it's clear from what I've said, that's totally unacceptable under international law. Nobody would develop it because every weapon has got to be initiated by human command and you've got to know how it's going to behave after you initiated its launch. And so that's why Leon Musk's uh, letter was so bad, because if you just say we're going to ban autonomous weapons, you're only banning something like that. So you can have highly automated UAVs, which you take to an area and say, OK, go and look for targets of this type and learn about the environment while you're there. And if it hits people that it shouldn't hit, well, it wasn't a fully autonomous weapon, so it's not been uh, not been banned. So terminology matters. You can tell the Simpsons um, writers and mathematicians by training, but that shows in extreme how you can get misunderstandings. It's almost a spectrum from automated to autonomous with automated weapons, for instance, back in the machine gun firing through the propeller, there's no way you'd call that autonomous, but it was essentially automated. Modern cockpits are getting more and more automated, but they wouldn't be called autonomous. And then the uh, sort of US propaganda on the right, where you have a swarm of UAVs going in, looking for targets in a nice clean desert environment. So you know there's only hostile forces there and they choose their target and attack them. I've probably said it a couple of times. We're talking about autonomous actions because anything can make a decision. Machine learning is great at making decisions. Control systems, deterministic control systems also make decisions, but the action must be authorized. And the vital question, which we still got to answer as technologists, as well as the lawyers, is who or what authorizes the action that's taken? Now, interestingly, back in 2014 time, when Robin West and I were producing the uh, 
who had produced the paper and were having discussions with um, Red Cross people and various others, that the a Red Cross lawyer actually came up in the uh, a weapon system review, which I've illustrated on the right, saying, we don't want to talk about autonomy in the whole weapon system. We want to talk about autonomy in critical functions. That raises the question, what are the critical functions? But then if you take the work that we did earlier, which says you have a set of functions and you've got specifications, you can actually say which of those is critical. If you go through the targeting cycle and the targeting uh, authorization structure, you can actually say which of these functions is actually critical in, in the decision to release the weapon. And a lot of it isn't critical. But what you have to look at then is, is everything in that critical chain deterministic? Can you rely on it? Absolutely. And what they revolve around is the target acquisition, the security of knowledge it is a target, how well you've tracked it, because there are very good techniques in deceiving tracking systems around. How do you select the target? How do you actually know that that particular thing is a Scud missile, not a petrol tanker that looks very similar? And is has the given weapon system actually got those critical functions correct. If you were to change weapon system, are you relying on a different set of critical functions or is any element of those critical functions different? And is that no longer deterministic? And so those were the questions, or that was the particular question that the Red Cross uh, posed. And it, for once, it was a good meeting of minds of the technical community and the legal community and the diplomatic community. Which brings us on to the um, United Nations discussions. They have a group of governmental experts on lethal autonomous weapons. Um, we're in the world of diplomacy, so we're in the talks about talks stage rather than the real talks because the real talks should be straightforward if the talks about talks are straightforward. They started in 2014 and they will terminate in 2022 when they report to the group that looks after that um, convention on certain weapons to say whether they need a new protocol or not. That's the room in Geneva. The, um, that it happens to be the, the session, one of the sessions that I um, addressed as an independent technical expert. And there are two of us on this side as experts, two of the other side, the chairman and the director of disarmament for the UN. 85 nations, simultaneous translation into 10 languages and so on. So it's a little bit um, awe inspiring to do that. And it's very interesting as a technologist to go through some of the briefing sessions as to what to expect, code words, not code words as in security, code words. If the question contains that phrase, it says, I am see a minor problem, but I'm trying to support you, or I'm pretending this is a minor problem and I'm going to launch a devastating attack at you in a second. <laughs> And there's whole sets of keywords in these discussions that go on that you have to be aware of. However, the chairman, a chap called, called Amandeep Gill for a couple of years, did some very clever work. And we had quite a lot of interesting discussions on the technical side with the technical experts. And he came up with the concept of human machine touch points, and he called it the sunrise diagram. And this took about three days of these 85 nations to agree. And then in first pass through, 
the second session later that year, it took another day to agree that everybody agreed the words. So going through it, starting on the bottom left hand corner, it's like just like the system engineering system or system side. You've got the politicians involved, goes through research and de development, testing, deployment and training, command and control. You use it, you have the abort decision and post use assessment. And around that, you've got this framework of national regulations cover the whole whole time from beginning to end. You've got international regulations which currently cover that. You've got industry standards covering that and the national regulations which uh, rely on those standards. Now the step they took was to actually say if you have an autonomous system and you have meaningful control and to, to get them to say meaningful and control without the word human was another two days of work to get 85 nations to agree what meaningful meant and what control meant. But if you have meaningful human control, then in an autonomous system or a very highly automated system, because of the non-determinism of the system, then right back in the development phase, software engineers are making decisions which say how the software works. They're saying what the limits are. They're coming up with a probability of identification. And the political direction saying what type of target you want it for. There are humans involved all the way around this side. So the recommendation and included in the 11 principles that have come out of those meetings is that there will be responsibilities for people on this side of the curve. So the question that's now being asked is, will the designers or the chief engineer of, for instance, BAE Systems or Raytheon or Boeing or Lockheed Martin, be taken to the International Criminal Court because they didn't make the correct decisions in this development stage? Will it be the company that carried out the subcontracts company that did the evaluation? Are they responsible when something goes wrong? There's a whole set of these very worrying issues. So we have a completely new legal problem, which I think I've said everything on that slide in the words before comes down to authorization design and testing and so on so the implications are pretty horrendous if we begin to bring in machine learning and we know it'll come in it's becoming pervasive and what's even more worrying is it may well come in in some of the systems that we rely on as as you get into procurement of um, civilian systems and bring them in, you may have machine learning there and you don't know. You know, image analysis, what's the training that's gone into it and so on. And the supplier becomes liable for the consequence of the actions. Well, those who are on the military side have been puzzling about this for about three years, something like that. I won't go into it, but you may have seen recently that the Department of Transport is saying the automated lane keeping system can be introduced on UK roads in November this year. There's an interesting dialogue going on between the Law Commission, Department of Transport, the Law Commission is the, or the two Law Commissions, Scottish and, UK and English, one, English and Welsh ones, are having a debate with the um, Engineering Council and the Royal Academy of Engineering, what the implications are for technology and does the whole of consumer law need to be rewritten? So they, this problem we've had in the military side is coming through to the civilian side. So can we limit behaviour? Possible responses, obviously high level systems approach. That's almost something people say flippantly, but it's serious. You need analysis and architecture. 
architecture must drive it. Architecture, there are a lot of people who think when you put the little boxes of the system down on a piece of paper and draw interconnecting lines with whatever smart piece of software you've got, you've got an architecture. You've got a description. The architecture actually drives the design, and that's a fundamental principle. But you must have an architecture which separates the human and the machine decisions and the actions with authorization as one of the key drivers, which currently is not, is not in most architecture standards. And then risk identification and mitigation are essential. I put, and that, that must flow through the whole design cycle, which just to remind you what it was, I put that on the bottom. Actually, it's not such a horrendous task as technology develops, as you think. I put in the OODA loop as a set of tasks, and this goes through the targeting process, which is a well laid down process that all military, organi all, all military organizations use. You go to the target area, you observe it, and you identify or indicate which the targets are, the observed side. And the star I put in denotes a decision time. And so you go through, you identify the targets. You can, I, you have an alternative action. You can say, no, I don't believe it, or no, they're not targets. Then you look, do a collateral damage assessment by saying what non-targets are there, what's going to happen when the weapon impacts, do your collateral calculations, which can be quite quantitative. There may be some judgment. You, judgment is more testing against the rules of engagement, which again, you have a decision. And then you prioritize the targets. If there are more than one target or is more than one target in the area, and then you release the weapon. So you can actually see from that, that as, you, as technology develops, and you introduce automation, you can bring it in in a way that if you know where you are in this chain, you can actually begin to say, I can put a flag in, a human has to say, yes, I agree with this at any of these points. As you become more confident, you can begin to uh, take out some of these and then you go through an Article 36 review to clear that. Now, I said about architectures and how they have to drive it. In 2002, a long time ago, there was the 4D RCS, four dimensional real time control system architecture standard that came up. And it's quite well known in the military side and it's based on command and control. It's in the um, three, part, three part model. It looks a bit more complicated, but it's got sensor processing, value judgment, world model and behavior generator. So these are the processing, the modeling, understanding and deciding what to do. As I say, sensor processing on the left hand side, the world model, you get the prediction side, you update it. The value judgment is where you quantify the qualitative judgments, and that's the area that you have to worry about and where you do need to get involved with the lawyers. And the behavior generator gets the command from the value judgment function, which says, yes, it is a legitimate target. The behavior generator then actually goes away and targets a weapon or does whatever mechanistic things are needed to ensure the weapon hits the target. So comparing model in the real world and acting. I, say, I said it's a, it's a hierarchy. And so each of these uh, entities from the previous slide become one of these boxes. And you have a, a typical military command chain. The area commander flows down and the 4D RCS uh, standard and the publication that it came out in actually takes down the bottom level right at, right at the bottom. It brings in the actuators that drive the tank, tank's wheels, and it uses that 
as a um, as the bottom level. But what it also does, you see, is it's in levels. So you can say, I'll have autonomy here. I'll fully automate that because it's not in that chain down the weapon side. So you can begin to separate things. And it gives you a clue of how to get on. And as I've said, each node can be a human or a machine because you're defining what it needs, what information it needs. And each task is in a node. And, uh, but only the behavior generator chain has the authority to act. And the question comes, can you restrict its actions and simplify the legal and human machine problems? There isn't a neat answer to that. The answer that um, I've put forward, and this is why I got invited over to the UN and the like, that I've come up with a concept called authorised power, and it's put in the book that I published uh, in 2019, that you actually say, you actually define the range of actions that each node can do. And my co-author on a paper we've done on autonomous cars also said, uh, who is a computer scientist, said the inverse is it must also be true. No other actions are allowed. But you also define the information needed to allow the action and you give it an option of referring up, which brings in the question of reaction times. And that's part of the design route. So every node must have some limit on its power. And then the twist, which we've not put in mathematically, because there's a lot of mathematical analysis goes on with architectures and uh, control systems, that the total autonomy level of your weapon system is the sum of the authorised power of every node in it. Let's so say that's something we're working on at the moment. I'm getting very near the end. Remaining technical problems. How can you make it a system recognise it doesn't have enough information to make a decision. My computer scientist friends assure me that mathematically at the moment it is impossible for a machine learning system to say I don't know. Alexis apparently can say I don't know how to answer that question which is a fudge but you can't actually you know, an autonomous machine learning system will always come back with an answer and always tell you it's greater than 90% certain it's correct. So you've got that problem. Can it say what information it needs? That's easier to solve. And then if you've got a correct architecture, you can actually flag up, it is over in that node over there. So you can send a message and say, bring it in. And then the question of how can you make sure that the humans have got better and more informed decisions Summarising, IHL applies to weapons. There are big problems with autonomous systems, but there is a new new protocol in development, which do bring li new liabilities for companies and individuals. The technical solutions are underway, and it's essential that lawyers, military people, diplomatic and technical professions worth work together. It's interesting as an ex uh, sort of MOD type person, I was also in uh, BAE systems for a good number of years. You have to bring diplomats into your discussion. That's a, a new one. And as I've said, the same problem occurs for road vehicles and that's watch this space. Don't believe the headlines that say autonomous cars will be on our road in November. No, they're automated cars which uh, must be under human control. Just to get a little bit more local, uh, we all know about Cody and the Cody flyer. That particular picture I think comes from a cigarette card in the Edwardian era. It's not quite like that. Cody wanted to fly an unmanned, he called it a kite, we would call it a glider, but he had it over the road, over the road from my house on what is now the Farnborough airfield, had a line of soldiers ready to push this thing with an engine on it for it to take off and go in whichever direction he wanted it to go in. 
Along came the policeman who was there to keep foreigners and other undesirable individuals out of the area. And he asked Colonel Cody, can you tell me where that kite is going to land? And Colonel Cody sort of shuffled his feet, shrugged his shoulders and said, somewhere over there, which is probably somewhere in Church Crookham, that it would come down. And the policeman said, that's too dangerous. I'm not allowing you to uh, fly that aircraft or whatever he called it until you can give me a cast iron assurance you know where it's going to land, which he, he said in polite language at the Aeronautical Society in 1908. So he actually had to completely redesign what he wanted, put a seat in it and fly it. So had that policeman not intervened, then Farnborough might well have been the world centre for unmanned aircraft technology right back from 1908. So at that point I'll stop and we can go on to questions. Tony, um, given that we're always going to have to have, I think, a human in the loop, can we ever have a truly autonomous system? No. <laughs> Sorry to be so simple, but no. You, you, um, that's where you get back to definition. You can have what I call highly automated, which is a little bit pedantic, but you must always have a, a system that when the last human says go, it will do exactly what that human thinks it's going to do and be reliable. Yeah. So um, what what are the legal situations then for the humans operating the autonomous systems then? I mean, I, I know this we've covered a lot in the in the, in the talk, but uh, for say the, the the predator operators who are um, in effect. Um, the uh, you know, the predator operators will have rules of engagement and they're actually a set of requirements which are a list where they have to say have I have I identified the target correctly why why do I know it's a target is that a legitimate um, identification of a target then there will be rules it is legitimate because I have been following that particular vehicle from an enemy base for the last so many miles and I haven't lost contact with it. So I know it's that same vehicle. And then where where can I release it? Where can I ensure the weapon hits it? Are there civilians in the area? No or yes, there are civilians. I've got to wait. And then um go through this list and stick with it now those rules of engagement have been agreed with the legal authorities at the time and very often there is a lawyer actually um, looking at the decisions that are being made and being good lawyers they say i believe that's correct i'm not saying it is but i believe it is in the way they are and but so you can actually get good advice and the, the it's a very not contested it's a very highly safeguarded area that the legality of the weapon strike is does meet international humanitarian law instead there's one thing i didn't mention the definition of war and i put those two uh, or three law courts on the uh, first slide do you remember george bush declared a war on terror back in 2009. That actually was a very dangerous thing for him to say because the response from one side of the military was, we are going to war. International law applies collateral damage assessments. Collateral damage means you are allowed to kill people who are not the enemy, if the military necessity allows it. Not particularly moral or ethical, but you're allowed. If he hadn't said, it's a war on terror, and just said, we're dealing with terrorists, then international humanitarian law applies where you're not allowed to kill anyone, almost regardless of the need to kill someone else 
or take make someone else change their mind it's a completely different set of law and that i know set a lot of legal minds whizzing and whirring and i don't know how to settle it in the end but it's quite interesting how these different laws apply sorry going back do have i actually answered your question about autonomous yes. ones? i think there's, there's quite a lot of confusion between autonomous and automation and i think the same will be true of of cars when we're talking about the automated lane keeping systems at the moment we do have um cars with systems that um, can um, maintain the, their position in the road. Um, but now that the, the, the latest version is for the um, driver to no longer be in control of the vehicle. So we're, the, the transport um, is, are saying um, that um, it, it's quite OK for um, the driver to, to send an email or watch a film or, or, or something but because the, the system that is operating the vehicle is now going to maintain its position in that in that lane autom autom automatically um, or autonomously in, 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 in that in that respect because the human is now no longer in the loop. Yeah. Well, interestingly, um... There was a discussion this afternoon between various motor manufacturers and people that I was sitting in on a Zoom meeting, I hasten to add, where the conclusion was that with something like the ALK system, the driver can't be doing emails as the ALK system comes in at the moment. They've got to be continuously engaged because they can stand in and they quoted a Tesla an accident with a Tesla car where there were two cars, one behind the other, and the car behind was on autopilot. The driver was doing something else. The car in front suddenly pulled over because there was a big concrete barrier in the road. The Tesla autopilot thought, car in front is no longer 10 meters in front. I can accelerate. So it accelerated smack into the concrete block because it had nothing to say there is a big concrete block in the road. And because the driver wasn't fully engaged, the first he knew was when the car hit the block. And mm -hmm. the debate the motor manufacturers were having was, well, if automation means the driver has to be so closely engaged, he's got to be sitting on the brake pedal all the time, nobody will pay anything for these automated yeah. systems. No. Well, it certainly isn't really. Well, I, don't, I, I, I see huge problems with um, an, an automated or autonomous vehicle. So, uh, but, but I am an, an ergonomist, so uh, I'm yeah, very much the human that's stays that's in the loop. But um, we are ahead of the civil side. We're way ahead <laughs> of the civil side. <laughs> but um, I think that for some reason, I don't know whether it's the system, whether it's the um, the team system, but we haven't got any questions. Hang on, a new question just come in. Aha. My screen is still saying no attendees. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we've had up to 30, nearly 40. Now we have a question from uh, Mike Philpott. Um, you talked about the UN discussions on the legal framework for autonomous weapons. Have countries like Russia, China, and especially North Vietnam bought into this process? Hello, Mike. <laughs> We do know each other from some years ago. Uh, the answer is yes, except North Korea. And one of the fascinating things, and part of my um, briefing the night before, involved what you can and can't say to keep the countries that are there in the room. And I won't go into particular detail. But uh, we all had to send our presentations in and we're allowed six slides um, to be checked beforehand. And one, there was one particular um, set of slides that were not allowed because it would have given one of the big powerful countries the excuse to walk out. And if they walked out, then the whole process collapsed. So I said it took several days to get me, get the countries to agree particular words and combinations of words. And the whole game was keeping them in the room because no country wants to be the one that causes the breakdown. And they came up with 11 principles. 
which I can't remember them all, but they did agree those which are general top level, which can go forward to the UN. And so, yes, they have brought in and there's a lot of fighting going on not to be the one who leaves the room, <laughs> but to see if uh, another person can leave the room. And the other one, which is also very interesting, if you don't mind me going off at a slight tangent, I had the questions I expected from Russia. I had questions from Russia and China and um, various countries who developed the weapons, and they were very much along the lines of how will you, how will the solutions fit in with our procurement process, which are straightforward technical ones. But then the Cuban representative said, all right, well, first of all, they asked the question um, about probabilities of, of image recognition. But then they said, well, if we have these reviews, Article 36 reviews, which carry on, we are a country that is going to be surveilled. We're not going to be doing the surveillance. So how can we as the victims of these technology be assured that the treaty will guarantee our rights and we will know that the, that the surveillance is going to be used against us, meet international law? And another country popped up and said, yeah, agreed, not only that, but we're likely to be buying these weapons and we don't have any manufacturing industry, but we want to buy them and use them. How can we be sure that this information is coming over? And by the way, we anticipate a lot of it will be secret <laughs> in the development. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's some fascinating discussions that go, go on in these things. Well, I've got a few more questions for you now. Um, coming in fast and furious. Um, Mike Adam asks, um, could an autonomous computer hacking tool or a computer virus come under the rule for autonomy? Yes. Um, I say yes. Um, defence against hacking tools is something that must be, is part of the requirements of robustness and reliability and so on. The question of cyber warfare and that side of things is not something I'm expert in. It is a subject of huge debate and I, I, I'm afraid I've really got to duck that question. And I, don't, I, I just don't know the answer except I know it is a big problem. And yes, it, certainly. And, uh, and so, you know, in the UK it's covered by different laws to weapons. Certainly a lot of people doing a lot of work for in that area. Another question from Victoria Cope. Uh, does the topics raised today apply equally to UAVs undertaking surveillance, um, any sort of military or civilian, as well as those with, with weapons? So is it um, across the board, not just uh, weapon aiming? The problems I've come up with today are when they're weaponized. If they're just doing surveillance, then they come under airspace management and privacy laws and so on. If it's a military operating zone, then they will be under, presumably under military control and will have to fit whatever. And if it's not an, a war theatre, then the military operating in that country have to follow the, the laws of the country they're in. And so the surveillance will have to fit the national laws of that country. So I assume that the ones in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq follow the Afghanistan and Iraqi laws and air traffic management comes in. So no, the difficulties I've said about are um, weaponized. The, the problem comes where you have a non-weaponized surveillance UAV feeding information to a weapon system, whether it's a strike aircraft or a Tomahawk missile or whatever it is, it's the use of the information then raises the question and whether it's got autonomous learning systems in it. Daniel Jenkins is asking, are there concerns regarding the loss of the human touch um, for even semi-automated systems? Are rem as remote operations can de-emphasize human operators? i.e. firing a remote UCAV um, feels more like a video game than firing a weapon from an aircraft you're in. So the 
Yeah, the, the there, there are. Um, and this was one of the things that came up early on where he, uh, back in the probably the early 2000s or the 1990s where uh, I'll call them pilots, the UAV is contentious whether you call them pilots or operators if you're talking to uniformed people, but where pilots were sitting in a porter cabin or a control room in the day and then leaving the base and going home. And one particular pilot said to me or reported to have said, it's incredibly difficult to go from life and death decisions in a field of operation to the parent teacher association in the evening. And that's a real psychological problem that they have addressed. And I believe people go on operations for a period. So they have that break. And there is the, the, the human touch does matter. And that is um, this expression, meaningful human control does encapsulate the human touch in there. So it is a big problem. Yes, yes. The, because of what the uh, the humans can see from the um, the UAS system and, and the damage that's being caused, they're, they're actually um, looking at some very undesirable body parts, etc. And the result of the missile, etc., which normally a, a fast jet wouldn't would never see. But of course, the the operators are seeing. Uh, you know, but then, um, soldiers see it in battle and so on so it's uh, but again it, it it's bringing the human side in the people are much more close much more closely involved which i think is a good thing yes okay well i'm thinking that um i can't see any more questions coming in so i think um perhaps we'll we'll bring this one to a close and um, thank you very much um, for a really interesting talk and very topical at the moment. I'd like to uh, close the close the session and um, thank you very much and uh, I hope our audience enjoyed it. Thank yes, you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. <laughs> Goodbye.